We're going to do a quick little Zoom introduction here, but first, my name is Josh Torkelson, and I am the digital coordinator here for the Vesterheim Folk Arts School, and I've been looking forward to today's conversation with Jan and Jennifer for uh, several months as we've been planning and getting ready for uh, this talk, and I, I really hope you enjoy it today. So we've created this program with a few of the following goals in mind. Uh, one is to sort of give you all a chance to connect with our beloved folk instructors during this time where we can't see them in person, or maybe you're uh, super far away, maybe you're calling in from Alaska, and it's a great way to connect from your home uh, and uh, be in conversation with both Jan and Jennifer today. It's also a chance for us to uh, use our, what do we think is our greatest asset here at Vesterheim, our collection, uh, to uplift that and share some unique stories with you, uh, history, and, and sort of aliven those folk traditions. All right, let's introduce our speakers. So first, Jan. Jan Mostrom is from Chanhassen, Minnesota, and has been uh, a weaver for over 40 years with a special interest in Scandinavian textiles. She teaches weaving and rug hooking throughout the Midwest, and her patient and encouraging instruction creates an inspiring class atmosphere for weavers of all levels. Jan earned a Vesterheim gold medal in 1999 and is a longtime member of the Weaver's Guild of Minnesota's Scandinavian Weavers Study Group. She learned to weave from Lila Nelson, master weaver and Vesterheim's first textile curator, while she was a student at Luther College here in Decorah, Iowa. Since then, she studied with many Norwegian teachers in both the United States and in Norway. Her work was included in Norwegian folk art, The Migration of a Tradition, a 1995 traveling exhibition curated by Marian Nelson, former Vesterheim executive director, and the exhibition book by the same title. I'd also like to introduce Jennifer Kovarik. Jennifer is our collections manager, youth educator, and wearer of many hats here at Vesterheim. She's the hands, the mind, and the heart of our collection. She knows it in and out and has an extensive knowledge and background in folk art and Norwegian history. I asked her once to share what her favorite object was in the collection, and she told me it's not the objects, but the stories and their traditions and what they can reveal about the cultures and histories that really make them special. And and I think today's uh, presentation, you'll really see that that is true today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, both Jennifer and, of course, to Jan, and I'll share the presentation. If you have any technical questions, please drop them in the chat, and we'll do our best to troubleshoot with you. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to have you joining me today. Um, Michael, I want to thank Vesterheim and Jennifer and Josh for making this happen and um, for including me in a collections connection. When they asked me, I thought, well, I'm just going to pick some of my favorite coverlets from the collection. And after I picked them, I realized that I had done weavings that related to all of them. So we're going to take a little peek at those today, just short peeks at those, to see how inspiration could come from the collection. Um, there's four coverlets that I'm going to talk about. A cover, couple of them have stories that go with them. One is quite funny, I think, and the other is a great love story. So that makes that coverlet my favorite in the collection. Um, so I think we're ready for the first slide, Josh. This is a rudevev or a square weave tapestry. This is a very typical weave structure for Norway, especially along the coastlines. Um, it's about, let's see, it's about 45 by 56. So it would fit one of those um, beds that were kind of built into the corner. It dates from um, 1770 to 1800. So that means all the dyes are natural dyes that were used in it. The um, structure of the eight petaled rose is very old, has been um, the design structure. The eight petal rose um, is one of the oldest design elements used in the root of Ev. 
and also the diamond shapes that um, border. I got to quit pointing <laughs> that border the uh, the roses is a very old structure. Um, the the rose design has been used in many of the Norwegian folk arts, including carving, knitting, um, whole rosing. Uh, and so it's 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 from Viking times or earlier even, and it's also been used in many cultures in Europe and around the world. Um, if you can see the petals here are kind of flattened on the end, and it's typical that there would be two darker colors against a lighter background that would alternate around. So the red and the green are alternating, creating that eight petal rose. Um, along with the root of structure or the tapestry, there's also often other elements that are woven into the borders like stripes or hag's teeth, which is pick and pick, which means that one row is one color when you're weaving and the next shot of color is a different color. And that creates little vertical lines. And they were called hag's teeth um, or old lady's teeth because in medieval times and later, there wasn't dentistry. And when a woman became pregnant, she would often lose a tooth because the baby took so much calcium from her body that her teeth would get weakened and you'd have those missing teeth. Um, inlay floats were also used and they would be longer floats on the surface of the weaving that would create maybe little H's or turtles or crabs or just lines that would go across. Um, and sometimes they'd even use rows of croak brog at the beginning and the end. This one has some crosses at the bottom and I think there are H's at the top. Um, it's a single interlock tapestry. And I have a little film that shows how, oh, let's look at the close up first. And you can see they're, they're interlocked. There's no slit between the squares. Each, each single square in this one has six, six threads in, in the demonstration that you're gonna see there's only four threads per block, but you can see in that white square there were six. Okay. This is a demonstration here. The first side from left to right you're putting your butterflies in and you're just letting them hang. You're not interlocking them at all. They just hang where they land. Um, each of these blocks is four threads. So it helps to count pairs as you're going across. When you have a long stretch like this one, you need to allow more, more wool in that path, in that um, square, that design element. And you keep going all the way to the end and we'll take a break and come back when I get to the end. Okay, this is the last butterfly. That's now all the way to the right. We've made sure that we have extra for these long stretches and we can beat it, change the shed. So now the opposite threads are up from when we started on that side. So now my right hand salvage thread is up. I like to start with the salvage thread on that side 
up because it gives me something to turn that butterfly around and it gives me a, a firm line there. Um, going from right to left, I've started the interlocking where the, the butterfly goes over the next butterfly before it gets inserted and that interlocks it kind of like, like that. And um, I will keep going all the way across in that way. And it will be interlocked all the way across. It will be this look the same on the back side as the front side, because that interlock just sits between the two warp threads. If I interlocked it in both directions, there would be a bump on the front side, right on where the two colors join. So again, going in this direction, we have to remember to allow more yarn where there's a longer stretch. And I would just complete this row beat and that would be one pass of going from left to right and then back right to left. And this is my piece that I was weaving on for the demonstration and it's right behind me. I'm sitting in front of that loom now. So uh, you can see that I have the um, eight petal rows. I don't have the flattened points. It's more like a star than a rose. And instead of two colors alternating, I use four colors alternating. And it also has the diamonds that was in the original one. The story of the original weaving is that Marion Nelson's relatives um, from Norway, they fled Norway during World War II. They lived in the Golbenstall Valley. And when they um, came to the United States and settled in Minnesota, Marion Nelson went to visit them one day and he was, he was talking with them and visiting and Lila Nelson told me that the family asked them if there was anything that they had brought from Norway that he would like to have for the museum or for himself. And he said, well, yes, I would like to have the dog blanket. And of course they were kind of appalled <laughs> that he wanted this blanket that the dog had been sleeping on. And, uh, but he assured them that that's really what he wanted. And it was this weaving. So um, that's the funny story <laughs> from the collection. Okay, we can go on to the next coverlet. Yeah, we had, we had one question from, from Connie who just wanted some clarification on the term husky that you had referred to the pointed weft pick, the word husky. Husky? I don't know, Connie, if, if you wanna chime in, you can ask the question. Oh, it was, it was husky or something. It was that, um, that you referred to the pick. It was hag or, hag or something. It was the teeth like picks. It was a term you used. Hag's teeth? Um, I can't think it must have been a misunderstanding or a mispronunciation on my part. Well, <laughs> oh, the hags, hags teeth. That's what it was. That's it. Okay. Or old ladies teeth because okay. of the women losing their, they, they used to say that a woman would lose a tooth for every baby she'd had. Okay. So. Hag teeth. Okay. Yeah. Thank I'm sorry. So much. And then what kind of yarn was used for the warp and the weft in that last piece you're, you're working on right now? Um, it's a single ply, kind of a heavier weight, almost probably worsted weight if you're a knitter. Um, yeah. So, but it's kind of heavy and it's single ply. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
Thank you for the question. Okay, the next coverlet is a croak frog coverlet, and it's in bright reds and gold and and then a dark brown. And um, what's interesting about this coverlet to me is that the center is a double croak frog structure and the borders are single croak frog. It was woven sometime, um, it belonged to Marion, was donated by Marion and Lila Nelson again. Um, it's about 45 inches wide. Um, if, you're from, if you're a weaver, you might know that croak rug is just woven on three, thread, three harnesses and it's threaded like a point. So it's one, two, three, two, one, two, three. So when you look at the threading, it's like a zigzag. The double croak rug has double points on the zigzag on both sides. So that threading is one, two, one, two, three, two, three, two, one, two, one. And so every point has two points. And if you look at the close up, you can see that there are two points in the designs too. There's a pair of crosses, red crosses coming out of that design. And maybe we can see the next slide where you can see the difference on the border. There's only a single cross on the red. And then there's the kind of hashtag or double cross in the center. So you're using the same colors. You're using just a slightly different treadling and you can get that effect of having much more variety going across your weaving. Um, the colors in this look like they might be not be natural dyes, but I don't know for sure. But that pink and brighter yellow and brighter green might be aniline dyes. The dates for this was um, really wide, sometime between 1830 and 1970. It was donated by Anna Garmore Paulson, who immigrated here in 1890. So um, I don't think we know anything more about that, but I would guess that maybe it was woven after 1850 just because of the brighter colors. But I could be wrong, <laughs> it's a guess. Okay, and then this is a, cover, a wall hanging I made that is um, has the single croak frog on the borders and double croak frog in the middle. Hopefully on your computer, you can see that because it'd be a little bigger image. The next cover look that I, that I really like is a Rhea that has a green backing and white knots across the whole middle with a row of red and, and or, uh, gold knots going down the side. Um, that one has kind of a wide date to some somewhere between 1830 and 1850. I, Again, it's got pretty bright colors. You can get those colors from both of those coverlets with natural dyes, but these are kind of bright. So I'm guessing it might be after 1850 again, but again, it's just a guess. Um, the backing on this is um, very, set very close together and it's kind of a heavy yarn. Um, if you're a weaver and use the Norwegian yarns, um, it would be like an Ocklicarn, so maybe about a worsted weight, but um, stiffer, a little st stiffer than knitting yarn. And it's set at 22 ends per inch, so it's almost warp face. Um, 
it's a point twill backing, but it has on both the points. So point twill is one, two, three, four, three, two, one. The ones and the fours have two warp threads that are threaded separately. So it's a little wider. Um, the, the backing yarn is quite heavy and the yarn in the knots is quite thin. It's like a 7-2 weaving yarn. So that would be, or 6-2 weaving yarn, and that would be like Pridvev if you use the, the uh, Norwegian yarns. You can see in some spots, like in the red zigzag next to, yeah, you can see that the points there are kind of a little bit fatter created by having two together. And then um, you can also see that we don't see any sign of the knots on the back, except there's kind of a thicker shot going vertically there. And that's because they would weave two shots in the same shed and catch it on the edge. So um, it would help to cover the knots well. Um, there you can see that the knots on the border, because that's folded down, are red and gold. And the rest of the coverlet is white. Um, the knots are quite close together. There's three or four to an inch and there's like six strands of that fine yarn in each of those knots. The rows are about an inch apart. So it's, it's quite dense. Um, let's look at the next slide. Oh, sorry, I, I'm sorry. I wanted to talk about um, how the two ends have the red and gold. Oh, do you want me to go back to the other one? Sure, sure. Thank you, Josh. I'm kind of jumping around on you, I guess. But so you have the red and gold edge on the salvages, but you also get a colored edge on the end, beginning and ending of the weaving because what they did is they cut off the warp which is all that green and red and gold stripes, tied knots, and then turned it over and hemmed it down. So you effectively get four borders on that. And it's quite attractive. It makes a nice way to hem it and puts a border. The, clearly the weaver had thought this through and wanted to have that border going on all four sides. It's a beautiful weaving. It's been well used. It's got some places where the knots are kind of thin and it's got a patch, a little black patch on it. But it's been well loved too, I think. So now we can go to the next one. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Um, this is the last one. Um, this is a Bria that was made to be used when um, someone was traveling across the open water and then also to be used as a blanket. It was, it's 63 by 57. Um, it was woven by Nicoline Indreberg. I'm probably not saying that right, in 1890. It has kind of a sheepy look, kind of an animal look to it. It has knots of kind of a thicker yarn, more like the uh, backing yarn in the last one, a heavier yarn. And let's see, we can go to the next. And you can see it's all brown and white wool, but there is actually also a lot of this dark greenish brown twill fabric in there too that's just a wool fabric. But it's amazing how it blends so well with the, the brown and white. And from a distance, it just looks sheepy. Okay. Um, the knots are also hidden on this one. This is the backing. This is woven 
very with the warps very close together again there's over 30 ends to the inch it's made in two pieces and she very carefully planned so that when she sewed it together you wouldn't have a break in the pattern of that stripe going across it's very expertly done um let's see um it is woven the weft for this backing is cotton which is unusual because cotton will absorb water so um but it works very well and it's packed in very tightly let's look at the next picture you can see there this was a, a two one twill so the the warp covers more on the underside than it does on the side with the knots. And if you look, there are little white floats. Josh can point them out. I think he knows where they are that, um, that show on the side with the knots, but not on the side that people would see. And there you can see how heavy the yarn is compared to the warp yarn too. Um, so Nicoline had made this um, coverlet for her husband, her new husband, Oli, who had to go to Lofoten to build houses. He wasn't a fisherman, but he would have had to cross the water and then he would have needed a warm blanket to sleep under. And um, if let's look at the next picture too. If you look really closely and dig around in there, um, you can see a little bits of blue, some homespun. I remember a little bit of pink cotton. These are kind of calicos, the blue and the pink. Um, and when I think about that, I think, well, there, there's no aesthetic value for putting them in because you really have to dig to find them. They don't show on the top. Um, there's really no functional reason to put them in because she had plenty of yarn and, and that green wool. And it also is cotton and it would absorb water if it got wet and be slower to dry than the wool. So this is my speculation and my sort of fantasy. I believe that she put those in for sentimental reasons. I think that the little blue that we see there is maybe cut out of the seam of one of her dresses. Maybe it's the one where they, where he had, she was wearing when he asked her to marry him or something. And I believe she really wanted to send a little bit of herself with when she sent him off to the Lofotens with his Rhea. Well, sadly, Oli died just nine years later. By that time, they had two children, Elsa and Petter, and um, they, they had to, um, Nicoline wanted to live in a different town, I'm assuming maybe to be close to family or to have some place where she could work. But it was 15 miles away. So she walked with Elsa and Petter, carrying everything that they could take. And so they took very few possessions. And um, one of them was this Rhea. And it was a very valued piece for the family because it was finally donated to Westerheim by the great granddaughter who talked about what a well-loved textile it was for their family. So that's the love story. <laughs> and uh, we can look then to the next. This is a little Rhea piece that I made. I used the green and red backing. You can see that at the top. And I kind of, it kind of references uh, Nicoline's brown and white um, Rhea that, that we just looked at. We can look to the next slide. 
I folded the top over on the green, just like the, the weaver of green, Rhea. And then the symbols there were taken from um, Crotin, which is white designs painted in on uh, cabin walls uh, that I saw in Hardanger. And here's a picture from the Hardanger Museum showing some croton. And um, they were, you can see that they brighten up a dark room, but they were also considered, I think, protective symbols. So I call that um, little Rhea protection. Um, I remember Anamor Sunbo talking about how protective symbols kind of were important and anything that zigzagged or changed directions was kind of considered and also a cross. So I have crosses at the top and the bottom were also protective symbols. But she said that her grandfa grandfather told her when she was tiny, you know, if the Haldro or the trolls start chasing you, you need to run in zigzags because they aren't very smart and they'll get mixed up and you'll get away. <laughs> so so um, I think that's the end of my talk. And um, I hope you enjoyed seeing sort of the references to from the collection to some of the weaving I've done, but also the stories of the weavings. So thank you for take coming. <laughs>